Uh, good afternoon, and I uh, hope you guys can hear me. My name is Sean van Berg. I head up uh, client education at PSG Online. Um, today we're talking about investment strategies, but specifically on value investing, growth investing, and investing for dividends. Um, to get started, here's my agenda. We can discuss uh, investment philosophy, and from there, obviously, developing a strategy that will fit. Uh, your personality, so you might be more of an aggressive or more conservative investor. Um, so it's important to have that kind of framework in place. And then we're going to go into more into the, what we call the value investing approach, uh, the GARP, growth at a reasonable price, and investing for dividends. Um, remember this presentation is being recorded, and I'll also be sending this presentation out to you, the PowerPoint presentation to all those of you that are attending uh, today's webinar. Um, so let's get started. Let's talk about um, investment philosophy. Um, obviously, uh, by now, I'm assuming that you've accumulated some knowledge uh, regarding basic share market concepts, what's a share, what's a dividend, uh, why do we have a share market, what causes the share price to go up and down. Obviously, the fundamental analysis, the macro view and the, and, and the macro view. Uh, so obviously, understanding some of those financial ratios, be it... Uh, uh, what is the PE ratio, what, how's, the, how's earnings uh, per share calculated and all that kind of stuff. But also to cover the sections cover, uh, called uh, sector analysis. Uh, remember, different sectors have different uh, financial ratios. So the, the industrial is relative to the financial, relative to the resources. So some, things, some financial ratios don't apply to, the, for example, uh, the insurance sector. So there we're looking at things like embedded value. Whereas in the banking sector, we have other financial ratios uh, that don't apply to the industrials and the resources sector. Um, but saying that, it's, it's ongoing financial education. Bottom line, you want to make yourself a, a better, more informed in, in investor. Uh, so you want to build that uh, framework to help you with the decision-making process. And that's what I'm going to try and get across to you today. So get started. Um, there's some good and bad when it comes to investment philosophy. There are a lot of them out there. Um, what's important, there's three things, obviously personal characteristics or financial characteristics and then your beliefs about the market. So when it comes to personal characteristics, um, obviously it's very important that you find a, or pick an a investment philosophy that fits your personality. Because if you don't, you're destined to, to, to abandon them, especially uh, when you're feeling some personal discomfort regarding your share portfolio. So fitting your personality is very, very important. Um, some of us are a bit more conservative, some of us are more aggressive, some of us are moderate. Also, um, you know, one of the things that you need to look at, um, you know, so patience is a virtue. Um, obviously, most of us lack it. Um, but obviously, some strategies, investment strategies, require more patience than others. So um, you have to be aware of that kind of stuff. Uh, risk aversion. Some of us uh, don't like uh, taking on too much risk. Some of us are a bit more conservative. Uh, you know, we want to preserve our capital. But also saying that, you know, you're not going to be making decisions based on uh, earnings uh, announcements when your view is a bit more conservative. So uh, to react short term uh, can be a bit dangerous. Right? As I say, you'll feel discomfort with that. And then it comes to individualism. You know, some of us uh, want to follow the crowd. Some of us go against the crowd. So some strategies uh, will apply to you. Some won't. You know, uh, a value investing approach is going against the crowd. It's a bit of a contrarian approach. So whenever else is selling, you want to be buying, whereas the growth or a momentum investing approach is, is, is following the trend uh, and going with, with the hot stocks as such. Um, so you have to take that in consideration in, in choosing your investment philosophy. Time, uh, we talk about time. Uh, the more time and resources uh, intensive than others. Uh, this is when it comes to your strategy. So it depends on, on, on your approach to the market, how much time you've got and how much time you can set aside. And then age is also important in the sense that um, as we age, obviously, we become a bit more conservative. But also saying that uh, if you've been in a market for a while, you'll also have uh, acquired some experience and some knowledge. In other words, you've got some baggage. Um, and obviously, that can also have, uh, uh, help you or affect you in your investment process. Um, when it comes to financial characteristics, um, there's, there's some things you have to look at in the sense that um, this can also affect your, 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 your investment approach, your job security, the amount of money you've got to invest, your cash needs, um, and also your, your current state, your, ta your tax status. You understand that these things do change, and obviously you have to adapt your investment strategy and your investment philosophy. 
as we go along through life. Um, but there's also, there's also other earlier signs of misfits to your uh, investment philosophy. You know, if you're lying in bed at night and, and you're worrying about your portfolio, or um, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're watching the market very, very closely, where you're supposed to be a buy and hold investor long term, or you're second guessing every single uh, uh, share in your portfolio, then you must reconsider your investment strategy also. So, um, and then thirdly, obviously your beliefs of the market, and this is uh, uh, also important, you know, different viewpoints, everyone makes the market interesting, but also, you know, you have to say to yourself, what is the, actually, what is the market actually? Uh, what does it do? What does it mean to you? Is the market uh, acting randomly? Is it, is it systematically or is it a combination of each? We saw yesterday in our market, our market dropped uh, 3% and it's the low, lowest we've been in two years and all of our investors were rattled. So um, the idea of this investment philosophy, we'll talk about it again just now, is that you start formulating a, a bit of opinion for yourself. So all it is, it's a, just a, a coherent way of, of thinking about the market. A set of beliefs uh, that will help you behave in a certain way and also uh, uh, understand uh, how the markets work. So uh, it dictates how you should be making your decisions. So it's having that world view. Um, you can ask the question, you know, are financial markets and world markets or, or the world itself, is it stable? And I think the answer is no. Uh, as, I said, uh, as I said now that the markets, uh, our market dropped more than 3% yesterday. So market instability leads to uncertainty and volatility. And obviously this produces or creates opportunities for the astute uh, uh, investor as such. But saying that, if you don't have investment philosophy, you're a person that lives on tips, on, on the whim, uh, on hunches and dreams and other people's opinions. You follow uh, what other people are recommending. Uh, and that's a, the problem with that is it leads to long-term uh, or poor long-term results. So the idea is that... Um, is that um, Ah, good. Some guys are working. Yep. Okay, I'm glad the guys are hearing. So, just as the questions come along, I'll be answering most of the questions. Um, we get to the end of the presentation. Just remember, the presentation will be sent out to you guys uh, with the recording also. Okay, so just getting back to what I said now. Um, no philosophy. Uh, obviously, uh, it will lead to poor results. So, the idea is that uh, it's all very well having this investment philosophy, but you must also combine it with discipline and patience. That's your temperament in, in the market as an investor. It comes back to what I said just now, your personality. Some of us don't like being investors. We're a bit more short-term. We prefer being a trader. So, uh, remember today we're focusing on, on the investment side of, of things. So, it's like having a good diet. It only works if it's sensible over the long haul and you stick to it. Okay, so there's that discipline aspect. But saying that, you know, a solid philosophical foundation, that's a starting point. From there, the work only begins. You, know, you never stop learning. So it's a hard work, the focus, and obviously focusing on the, on the patience and the experience as we go along. So saying that, let's um, talk about your investment strategy. So before building an investment strategy, you need to, as I say, reflect who you are. Are you a bit more uh, aggressive or a bit more conservative, a bit more moderate? Um, Reflect what you are, your, your investment strategy is saying, should fit your personality. But why are you want to get involved in the market? What, what is your objective? Uh, as an investor, obviously, it's buy and hold long term. Uh, obviously, you want to go for capital growth, uh, uh, maybe income from dividends and things like that. But write down those reasons why you want to get involved. Bottom line, you want to create yourself, you know, when you come to trading, we always talk about a, a trading plan. The same thing we're talking about here now, so having an investment plan. So it's having a one pager. What is your time frame? Now, when we talk about investing, investing your time horizon, your view should be three years plus. Uh, three years, as I say, uh, less than that, obviously, you're going to sell the share, cap, then uh, income tax applies, more than three years, uh, cap, capital gains tax applies. But your view should be three to five years longer, and ideally, obviously, much longer. Your involvement, how much time you're going to spend on, the, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, as an investor, it doesn't take as much time as trading. Um, your risk tolerance obviously would dictate what kind of shares you're investing. And obviously investment strategy, uh, are you going to be more involved with the big, large cap blue chip shares, the top 100 as I call them, or the small caps? And how many shares do you have in your portfolio? Now I've seen some portfolios where the guy has uh, uh, 50 shares in his portfolio. Now it gets to a stage where diversification doesn't help anymore. So it's important, we talk about portfolio structuring, uh, to have those kind of uh, uh, goals in, up front. Your goals, talking about goals, what is your average return? My goal is always to make at least 15% per, per annum. If I've got a three-year view, 
compound of 15%, I'm looking at 50% every three years. That's my goal. So I'm trying to find the shares that will meet that criteria. So I'm looking at outperforming inflation, let's say 6% plus the bond market is about 6% and I'm adding a bit more. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at around about 15% plus. So you need to develop your own little benchmark criteria, what, what, what I'm looking to outperform. But also, when would you sell, or what, 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 what will make you sell a share in your portfolio? I remember for in my portfolio, I'll take in my portfolio for many, many years, and I liked them. Uh, they were high dividend payers, I liked the annuity income aspect, but they weren't performing. Eventually, I had to make a decision, and I sold them, I got, got out of the share. Okay? So those are the kind of things. What will make me sell? There are certain criteria. Um, what will help you, what, what will make you change your investment strategy? Now, you shouldn't be changing your investment strategy all the time. You know, you're going to add on and maybe tweak slightly, but you want to change radically. So the point I'm trying to make is that with yesterday's market fall, a lot of people move in and out the market. They'll sell all the shares, move into cash, or they move into, into the money market. This kind of strategy where you've started to develop investment philosophy will, will prevent you from moving in and backwards and forwards from the market as the market goes up and down. So your goal is to find the right strategy and then stick to it. Now, fortunes are made by working hard at investment, okay, and then laying, laying down flexible guidelines. And we're going to talk about those guidelines just now. Bottom line, as an investor, all you have to do is manage your money or manage your portfolio. That's what an investor does. Okay. So before getting into the nitty gritties, you know, we talk about housekeeping. I believe that you shouldn't be investing in the market unless you paid off all your credit cards. By doing that, you've actually saved yourself 25%. Have you say, have you started an emergency fund? If something goes wrong, uh, and, and uh, you need some funds, you don't want to take it out of the share market. You know, you have to have, you have a certain cash, a certain uh, 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 amount of money available for that. You know, your, the money that you're investing in the market should also be what I call forever savings. This is money you do not need for the next five years. Okay? The point is, it's easy to think long term when your financial matters are all in order. Okay? So the idea is that once you've got a portfolio, and we talk about portfolio management, you'll give your portfolio a regular checkup. I do that twice a year. Um, obviously, I keep a, a small eye on it uh, on a regular basis, but once, a, once a, or twice a year, uh, I look at my portfolio, uh, give it a financial checkup, and I still and I look at it and I say, do I still believe in the opportunity? Do I still believe in the growth prospects and things like that? Yeah. Do you know when to sell, okay, or do you have a wait and see approach? So, as having that criteria in place, when would I sell a share in my long-term portfolio? And uh, it's not just selling because I'm making profits now. You should never have that kind of um, strategy. A uh, better approach is to be invested at the right time and the right place. Okay, but your purchase is important. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So it's having it. Uh, we talk about a macro view of the market. It's an 80-20 principle. Spend 80% of your time looking at the whole market and 20% of your time on the individual shares. Uh, some of you have seen this before. It's a top-down approach that I, I, I use every day of my life. Uh, having a view on the markets and then from there jumping down. Uh, ultimately getting to the stage where I'm looking at the local market. Um, so just give my little highlight here. Uh, you know, going down the local market, when I say local market is a JC all share, breaking down by industry, financial, industrials, uh, and then obviously resources and mining. Within those different uh, industries, I look at specific sectors now, and within those certain shares. But uh, this can be your, your portfolio. Once I've got my portfolio, and obviously, I've, I've, I've structured along the lines of quality, and I've looked at the line, along the lines of diversification, three to five different sectors, eight to twelve different shares. And in, as I say, my checkup comes to fundamental analysis. I've got my certain financial criteria, I've got certain technical criteria, and it comes to portfolio criteria. Uh, you know, again, what I said now, the structure, how many shares in my portfolio, diversification, and all that kind of stuff. So this is where we talk about the macro view. On the other side of the coin. Uh, we talk about the micro view. This is where you start looking at, or the bottom-up approach, where you're looking at individual shares. So the idea is that you want to know the company inside out. You know, I'm, my very first share I ever bought was a share called uh, Spur. Uh, when it was first listed on the, on the, on the JSC, uh, I was involved in Spur. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, I was, I was a, um, a Spur manager, I managed five Spurs. So I got to know the, the business very well. Obviously, over the period of time, Daniel Rotis came on board and John Dorries and things like that. But I got to know the company very well. Uh, but people think of Spur, they think about the share. So they don't think about the underlying business. So they think about something intangible, the share price going up and down. Remember, a share, if you as a shareholder or a part owner, uh, although it might be a small uh, uh, percentage of an actual business. 
Okay, think of it this way. If you have Pick and Pay shareholder, you and Raymond Ackerman, the founder of Pick and Pay, his whole family, will share in the spoils of the company. So in the that uh, Raymond Ackerman and his family might own more, you your share still counts. You know, they'll, they'll still uh, uh, elicit a vote from you when it comes to important decisions, especially electing the, the board of directors and things like that. So that's the one side of the coin, obviously your rights as a shoulder, but also every time a shopper buys groceries or buys a, a set of towels or even a television, a tiny fraction of that profit from that sale will ultimately come to you. Think about it that way. So the fate of the business, okay, of each year is tied up with the underlying business. So your goal, as I say, is to get and stay familiar with the companies that you own in your portfolio. Okay, so it comes down to three things. You know, we talk about quality, price, and value. So in past webinars, we have discussed all these uh, various uh, uh, measures. Uh, and we'll be discussing again the tools available on the on website. It's a big time saver. So yes, in the past, we discussed these measures, and we're going through them in the next slide. But bottom line, you want to ask yourself two questions. Focused on quality and price. Okay. Is this a strong and growing quality company, number one? And number two, is the company share price, is the share company, the, the share price price, uh, uh, priced attractively? If you don't answer those questions, you might end up buying a, a, a overvalued share in a great company, or you might buy shares in a, in a, in a hopeless, doomed business you think it is a bargain. Okay, so it's, it's that the two together, the quality and price, quality and value. So we're adding those together. So we had to look at all three aspects. So when we talk about quality, um, you know, obviously get a uh, free uh, uh, is, you know, some people say it's important to have some debt uh, with, when it's not manageable. That's a problem. So, um, you know, can the company pay its debt and is it manageable? So here we look at things like interest cover. More than three times uh, or less than three times interest cover on, on, a, on a large cap stock, the alarm bells or the red flag should be waving. For small cap stock, by the way, anything that's out of the top 100 by market cap, so we talk about the top 40 and the next 60 companies, the mid caps, the top 100 companies, what we call uh, 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 or the top 100 as such. They interest cover, as I say, three times. For a small cap, I'll go as, as high as, as five times. Remember, we're measuring risk now. Another thing you have to look at is cash. Cash is king. So is the company generating a lot of cash? Uh, is the sales or the, is the turnover growing and earnings growing by, by inflation or beating inflation? Is this operating margins improving? Is the trend going up? Uh, is the management smart or they executing well? So we can see that uh, uh, you know the, the management of uh, you know you can look at the, the board of directors, the, the the pedigree, who are they, and things like that. But also you can see these guys are, are keeping up with developments and things like that. So a bit more. Qualitative uh, management, a bit difficult to measure that. But the bottom line, I always say to myself, is a company generating value for shareholders? And you can see that by the share price going up and obviously the company paying out dividends. Okay. And um, you want to see a company that's well positioned in beating its competitors. We'll talk some examples just now. So when it comes to price, uh, we've looked at uh, a number of measures. Uh, the ones that we look at most of the time is things like price, uh, price earnings ratios, uh, which compares the share price to its earnings per share. Uh, at PSG, we like to use a ratio called the PEG ratio, which compares the PE to the company's expected or forecast uh, earnings growth rate over the next five years. So we'll talk, go into more detail just now. So once you've gone through all these little numbers as such, you'll have a better understanding of number one of the company's uh, quality. And when we talk about quality, we talk about safety, the, the consistency. The company is not so uh, uh, volatile in its earnings and uh, you know, it's got sustainable earnings and you can start measuring or anticipating what's going to happen. So that's why I talk about quality. Um, so you can make a better, you'll be in a situation where you can make a better judgment call. Uh, does, it, does this company offer value? So, um, and this is where the tools on the website come in handy. So you want to focus on, on undervalued or quality stocks. I like to combine it together, undervalued and quality. But you'll be foolish just to focus on rapidly growing shares. Okay? So you must understand there's a thing called momentum investing where the guys are going with the shares are flying through the roof. Um, they're buying to that. Obviously, the, the cliche is the trend your friend. If the shares are going through the roof, it'll carry on going through the roof. So we've seen the last few weeks, obviously, the rain hedge stocks have been flying, especially the industrial, industrial stocks like the, the British American Tobaccos and Richmonds. A lot of people piled into that. And that's where, uh, uh, and those were the shares that over the last two years have performed well. But we've also seen the last two days that uh, the market has fallen despite the rand being above 10 rand uh, 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 to the dollar. 
Okay. So uh, don't just focus on rapidly going and shares, or just just don't only just focus on on technical analysis. Now my background, I, I am a technical analyst. I use both. So some people just look at charts blindly and with the volume, with ignoring the the, value, the fundamentals behind it. So let's talk about the aggressive investor. Um, I've, I've taken this idea of uh, rule breakers from a website called MotleyFool.com. They call uh, rule breakers. These are companies that succeed by breaking all the rules. Uh, as I say, my small caps or anything that's outside the top 100. Then we also talk about penny stocks. Penny stocks are classified anything below one rand. Okay, we're talking about pennies in, in cents. Okay, um, obviously these are the shares that can give you the high returns, but also obviously the higher risk. So that's something you have to take in consideration. Um, it should be an element of every portfolio, I believe. You know, if you're, I always believe it's like having the Powerball. This is the one share that could shoot at the lights and have a big impact on your portfolio. But uh, if you want to invest in the exchange, you must also be prepared to lose the money. Okay, so they, they are very volatile and there's certain things that we do look at. Um, so how do you find them? Uh, we're talking about the top dog or the first mover. Usually in a very important or emerging field. And there's no use being a top dog in a left-handed scissors industry. Uh, obviously, there's not much demand there. But uh, you're looking for companies that de demonstrate sustainable um, earnings advantage. A uh, company's got it's building a uh, momentum. It's growing organically, not only doing by acquisition. It's growing from inside. Uh, it's growing. It's the business is doing well. Uh, it's got some patent protection. It has good management, uh, visionary leadership, uh, but also it's outperforming its, better, its competitors because the competitors are sleeping. Now the company that always comes to mind, uh, I think a few years ago, was Aspen Pharmaceuticals. These guys were top dog. Uh, they were the, became the leaders in generic uh, drugs. Uh, so yeah, they have good management. They have a good consumer brand out there. And there was a stage once upon a time where the financial media, this is an ideal situation, when you're going to get involved in like a company like this, where financial media actually overvalues a company like this. And uh, everybody's, oh, stay away from it. These are the ones you want to get into. But saying that, you know, other small cap stocks, uh, especially the shares not in the top 100, these are the shares trading under the radar screen of the institutions like the pension funds and that. Um, so yes, they will grow and eventually one day get onto the radar screens. Uh, you know, the, the, some institutions will start nibbling at them, the companies that have the mandate to look at the, at the small caps. But also remember, these companies have the growth potential. These are the shares that can go faster than a 500 rand share, um, but obviously there are risks involved. And that's one of the things they have to be aware of. Um, we're looking at the, at the top 100 companies. These are what they call the, the large caps and mid caps. These are the rule makers. So just going back to my example of Aspen, so obviously small cap companies will all grow bigger and bigger and become dominant in the industry. They eventually pull the shots and, and generate a greater value for the shareholders. Those of you who have been involved in Aspen for many years, I think uh, uh, Aspen has served you, served you well. So um, this investment strategy, obviously looking for the score awards. These, these are the companies that are financially strong. They are well managed. So they're generally the large cap uh, companies that we classified as blue chips. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be the, the expensive shares. The blue chips been around for a long time, good consistent management, good consistent results. Those are the blue chip shares. But saying that, it's not only the, the big companies uh, that will, uh, well, not all those big companies will meet our criteria. We'll have our fundamental criteria uh, a, bit, a bit later. So some of them are, as I say, the non blue chips, with the mid caps, even the small caps, will be worthy of, of your consideration. So this strategy, obviously, uh, you, there's some number crunching involved, but the bottom line is some common sense uh, logic and some patience. Um, you know, it's, it's like building up a unit trust fund. Obviously, you're going to be uh, above average performance at, at a lower cost. That's what you're trying to do. Okay. I'd identify them to say you want to go for the company with the number one brand in the industry. Uh, usually, I repeat mass market purchase. Now, uh, you know, some people go out and only buy a motor vehicle once a year. <laughs> not once a year, once in a while, or buy a washing machine. That, that, that's not repeat business. I look at a company like Vodacom and MTN, uh, where obviously people have, they have subscribers, every month they have debit orders. Uh, those are, that's repeat business. So that's, think of the, the, the things that you use on a routine basis, not because uh, uh, because you like it and because you have to. Okay, so yes, you have to crunch some numbers. Uh, bottom line, you know, you're looking at various um, quantitative numbers, or you can look at the numbers. Um, we look at debt also. Debt cash flow is very, very important. Um, you're not going to a company that that's that's that's, that's, that's managing its cash flow, um, and obviously you'll see a company that if it's if it's, if it's adhering to the 
to this criteria, you'll see the share price going up. Um, it's, the, it's the moving direction of, 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 of the trend. Um, so you want to see companies with rising margins. Uh, maybe if the, if the company has the price has fallen, then we buy back their shares. But uh, you want to see companies as far ahead of its uh, of its peers. That's what the kind of company you're looking for. This is the outperforming the shares. So let's go more into the value investing strategies. Um, let's talk about value investing. Um, that photograph is a guy called uh, Benjamin Graham. Um, he was a professor. He was one of two professors way back in. Uh, in 1928, that, that started, taught, started teaching this investment model uh, on investments um, way back in 1928, uh, together with another professor called uh, David Dodd, and they wrote a book called Security Analysis. And this other book, on, 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 you go back one page, uh, this other book, An Intelligent Investor, um, I've read it once. It's a, not an easy book to read. It's regarded as the Bible of, of value investing. But, uh, Benjamin Graham is regarded as the father of value investing. Uh, he had a, a remarkable uh, record as a stock picker for more than 20 years, between 1936 and 1956. Um, he was involved in a, in, in a mutual fund or unit trust fund where the compound average return was at least 14.7%. Uh, uh, and that's over a 20-year uh, period where the average of the market was 12%. Now, that doesn't sound, sound a lot, 2.7%, uh, I perform about 2.7%. But if you look at it, if you had invested ten thousand dollars, that difference, two point seven percent, would have earned you roughly about sixty thousand uh, dollars more on average. So yeah, so that slight outperformance uh, it does help. Uh, Benjamin Graham said that value investment was only the was the only real form of investment. Um, obviously, anything else was speculation. It was his feelings about uh, different strategies. So what is value investing? It's, a, it's taken many forms over the years. Uh, bottom line, you're trying to buy companies that are underpriced, that are trading, uh, uh, the price is lower than they're actually worth, and you use various uh, fundamental criteria, various numbers, you're looking for shares trading at a discount. It's a uh, thing that always talk, people talk about. We're looking for a share trading at a discount, either to net asset value or to its tangible net asset value, especially if the company's got uh, patents and, uh, and things like that, you'll see some tangible. Uh, obviously, the share price has fallen. Uh, the, 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 the inverse, obviously, the high, you'll have high dividend yields, um, low price earnings multiples, uh, low price NFV ratios. Those are some of the things that you look at as a value investor. So, um, Benjamin Graham, uh, he, we'll see on the next slide, uh, he, he spoke about this thing called margin of safety where he created a more of a defensive investment strategy, uh, looking for shares trading below a tangible net asset value. So you, you were looking for the extreme bargains. Okay. Um, and, and as I say, uh, he coined the phrase, phrase um, margin of safety, which uh, you can see as a quote from him. Uh, this is a price so low that you can make money even if some part of your analysis turns out to be wrong. So the price, does, you know, it might drop a bit lower, but not too far. For uh, 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 well, not too much further as such. So, value investor basically you're buying the shares where the rest of the market is thinking are lousy. So, as I say, you're a bit of a contrarian. When it was selling, uh, you're going to be buying. Um, Benjamin Graham, as I say, he insisted on a heavy discount. He came up with a thing called net asset, net current asset value, NCA, NCA v approach. And instead of looking for shares trading below the NAV, he went one step further. Look for companies that, if the company had to go into liquidation tomorrow, okay, what will it be worth? So you looked at only current assets, assets, things like cash, your stocks, and your debtors, some things that you can be converting to cash straight away. So you excluded uh, things like uh, assets, like buildings, and obviously subtracted long-term and short-term uh, uh, liabilities. So say he was looking for heavy discounts. He was looking for shares trading at two-thirds or less of the net current assets. In other words, price the, the NACV was, uh, was about 6% uh, discount. Now, all my years with PSG, every time I look at this uh, and I try and find the examples, I still have never in 13 years found a share trading like this. So, uh, obviously, this was applied way back in 1926. Um, I don't find shares that trade at such a big heavy discount. Uh, the problem with this, most of these companies will go private or uh, will be bought up by management. That's, a, that's one of the disadvantages of uh, value investing. There are common mistakes or uh, misconceptions of, of uh, value investing. 
Some people think value investing is just buying things at a discount, where they do not consider things like the quality of the business or, or, or growth, um, which is not very really true. You want to bring that into consideration also. Same applies to growth investing we'll talk about in the next section. Where uh, growth investing, the perception is we're just buying into quality companies with high growth rates and we ignore price, NAV, and things like PE ratios. No, it's a bit of, bit of both. Um, Warren Buffett believed that growth investing and value investing was the same thing. They joined at the hip. But um, the main focus of value investing, as I say, looking for shares are trading less than the intrinsic value. Okay, and intrinsic value can loosely compare to your net asset value. Um, the problem with that, there's no real correct intrinsic value. You'll have two people who get the same share of the same information, and you'll have two different values in the company. So that's where the challenge comes in. How do you know what is the company's value? And that's where we use various estimates. We look at the price NAV, we look at the PP multiples, and things like that to help us decide what shares to buy. So it's pretty us into that ballpark. Okay. So value investors, all we've got to be looking at, we're looking for shares that are undervalued. Uh, the market is sold them off, but also saying that, that uh, um, the price movements, the share might be trading low, but the fundamentals don't really agree with it. And uh, that creates an opportunity for the investor, especially when prices are, are deflated. So uh, as I mentioned just now, with uh, the problems of value investing, that uh, they are subject to management buyouts. Uh, the company can take in private. But also, you know, people might say, well, it's a lot of homework to do. You know, it's a lot of uh, financial documents I have to read through. Uh, very labor intensive, but saying that you know, on our website there's tools that help you sift through the criteria to focus on, on certain shares. So um, these are just some of the examples or some of the, the disadvantages of value investing. You need a lot of patience with this approach in the sense that you want to buy shares that are undervalued and you have to wait for the rest of the market to cotton on to the idea that there's value. And obviously the market forces eventually push the price up and you know, obviously make a profit. So yes, just be aware of those uh, those pitfalls. Okay, um, on our website uh, we have a thing called the the value investor. If you click on research and then search, uh, you can actually click on three different buttons here. It automatically spits out a list for you. For you. What I did in this example, I use the drop downs and it's focused just purely on price NAV below one. Okay, or less than or equal to one. In other words, I'm looking for shares trading at NAV, at net asset value, okay, or at a discount. That was my first criteria, and then I clicked on and, so I'm adding more criteria. And the peg ratio uh, is less than 75. On our, on our legend here, anything below 75 will be colored green, hence this little list here. You can see this is done uh, two days ago. Um, you can see there wasn't much of a, a, a list that your shares were undervalued. Uh, obviously, yesterday's performance might have brought some more shares into this. Our market is not cheap right now. A lot of our shares are fairly valued, which is what you see the colored yellow. So by combining two criteria also, it obviously makes it less a bit smaller. So you can see the, some of these shares here, uh, Anglo-American, for example, is trading at a 20% discount. Uh, and things like shares like uh, Morvest is trading at a 60% discount. So you don't just go blindly on that. So what I like to do also, that, the, that was the third criteria, was look at quality ratings. The so quality rating, if you click on the little tab here, I'm looking for shares of quality rating above 70. So I'm looking at bringing a bit more consistency into it, um, and uh, all those shares do meet that criteria. Okay. So uh, if I look at Anglo-American, all of us know Anglo-American, what I've done now, if I go back again, I've clicked on the link, AGL, takes me through the company analysis. So this is like a, a two-page document, tells you the nature of the business, uh, Comments more on the, on the company's results. Remember, this was on, uh, written on the 19th of February, based on the December results. So obviously, end of this month is their financial, the uh, interim results. Uh, in three months from now, we can expect the, the uh, results. Um, but uh, at that point in time, we gave it a buy recommendation. That was buy long term. Um, that's when the share price was 277. Uh, yesterday or the day before, I saw this uh, it was 215. So imagine it's even become cheaper now. Since then, you see that when we wrote this, the peg ratio was, was still 89, now we're way back to 75, so the shares is getting cheaper and cheaper. Technically, um, you can see how th this is a weekly chart. Now remember we're talking about investing. Yes, I'm uh, investing more fundamentals and technicals. I like to combine the two approaches together, what I call rational analysis. The more I, uh, informed I am, the more questions I ask myself, the, more, uh, the, the better decision making I can, I can have. 
So this is a weekly chart of Anglos. I can see it's trading below its moving averages. So yes, the trend is bearish. It's bouncing off a 66% retracement level. This is important. It can bounce from here. Might move a bit lower, but it's trading in the down channel. I can see it's also it's oversold. Okay, it's better than being overbought at the top of the cycle. So yes, we might have this little bounce soon off these levels. Um, usually if it doesn't hold the 66, it can pull all the way back to where, where it started from. Um, anything can happen with the share. But what I found interesting is yes, the share price making new lows. The indicator is doing the opposite. It's uh, what they call diverging. Um, so that was interesting. It's also might, uh, it's highlighting a possible turnaround soon. So yes, going a bit of against the trend. What else is uh, negative around resources? Might be the opportunity to start nibbling at it. Uh, this is value, a volume price trend. You can see uh, the price has fallen, but the volume hasn't really dropped off. So it's really not really showing too much volume dis distribution. Um, and this here is what I call relative strength. Relative to the whole market, JC Orshi, obviously the trend is down. We talk about market underperforming. So yes, um, this is a share that, uh, that uh, it might turn around soon. But this is a share you might add on, add on to your watch list. So uh, this is the approach you're going to start using, fundamentals and technicals together. Some different uh, investment principles, go through this very quickly. Um, obviously, you're, you're not following the, the market, you're going to follow the individual shares. Um, have, a, have a good idea why you want to get involved in the share. Uh, two shares from the best companies, when you say best, obviously quality and things like that. Stick to what you know. So I started out with Spur, I specialized in the business and I tell sector. And from there, I went on bench, uh, moving out. I have various uh, criteria, uh, a benchmark, uh, and uh, that will help you choose or identify the shares that are offering value. Um, obviously, you want to buy the shares at the right price, and that's where the technicals come in. And, you know, yes, you want to have a bit of a, 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 a balanced portfolio, but you have to cover all the bases. And that year, remember, this is a buy and hold strategy. Uh, you know, you should never ever sell a share because it's making a higher, uh, it's making a, a market, it's trading at a higher price now. So that should not only be the reason for selling. Uh, maybe something else has come up better, or um, the original decision has changed, or something has changed about the share. Uh, that, then obviously, uh, you need to reconsider your investments. Okay. Um, Warren Buffett, obviously, um, everybody knows Warren Buffett. Uh, Benjamin Graham was Warren Buffett's mentor. There are a lot of quotes about Warren Buffett. He's the most successful investor in the world. There's a lot of books written about him. There's one of the books I read about. A lot of quotes from Warren Buffett. And this is what I think is what coins a, a value investor. Price is what you pay. That is what you get. So obviously you can avoid companies that are overvalued um, and buy shares that are undervalued. Okay. Let's move on quickly. We're running out of time before we get into questions. We talk about growth investing. Uh, so we move forward. This is a guy called Peter Lynch. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, One Up on Wall Street, and he you know, wrote a follow-up on that called uh, Beating the Street. Um, but let's talk about Peter Lynch. Uh, he managed also a, a fund, Fidelity, so it was a, a big uh, unit trust company in the States. He managed one of their funds called Magellan uh, for many, many years, or 13 years. Uh, his average return over that 13-year period was 29%. We're so looking at the inflation at 3%, this is serious outperformance. What is also interesting is that no other fund managers ever managed a, size this, uh, a fund this size. We're talking about a $14 billion fund for such a long period of time. What I found interesting about Peter Lynch was his approach. You know, he's, he says he, he only bought into companies that he was familiar with, that his, him and his family had a positive personal experience with as a consumer. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting approach. What I liked about it, in his book, uh, he wrote about his approach uh, he says, financial, you know, understanding the, finan the financials was secondary, but it's more important you want to understand the company first. So you go visit a shopping mall and go look at the individual shops. I'm using an example. Okay? Uh, you look at individual brands, which, which brands were selling the fosters and at what prices, and then compare one shop to another shop. And then from there, you go look at the balance sheet and things like that. Okay? He avoided the, 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 the large, well-established well companies. He went for them more the small caps, the up-and-comers. Uh, the rule breakers, uh, so the, le the less well-known uh, uh, shares. Uh, obviously, he had portfolio that were <laughs> he had a lot of shares in his portfolio, uh, much more than I'm uh, saying between eight and twelve uh, in this in his fund. But uh, he was going for shares of what I call turnarounds or recovery stories. So um, that's where he focused on mainly. So again, very similar to, to a value investor, was very contrarian. Uh, he's looking for stocks that everybody else was ignoring. Uh, 
Um, but I found interesting as for this, his advice to a small private investor was all you need to do is find five stocks. Uh, that's all you need and then keep track of it. He coined the thing called the, 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 the 10 bagger. Finding the share is going to give you 10 times your money. In other words, a share will give you a thousand percent returns within five years. Now, uh, if that's what you're looking for and you only need five shares, you might spend more time with this strategy. So that was his thinking behind it. He coined this uh, a, a, a phrase, uh, a GARP. Uh, it's a bit of a hybrid, a mixture between growth and value investing. Um, what we call GARP is the growth at a reasonable price. Um, you look at another way is what I call sleep well at night, SWAN. Um, so it's a combination between value and, and, and growth investing where value investors, remember, are looking for shares that are, are cheap compared to the earnings in NAD. The growth investors are looking for things that are growing faster uh, than others. So they don't do too much detailed analysis on the company. Uh, they, they go for the high-flying growth companies. So it's a bit of a, 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 a balance between the two. He had various criteria. Yes, the company must be growing. Headline earnings must be growing more than uh, beating inflation by a nice margin. I use the, the example of, of head, headline earnings per share. Uh, peg ratio, you'll see it's on, on 100. Remember, they're investing below, below 75. So these guys are willing to pay up a bit more for that growth. So yeah, a growth or gap might sound like the perfect investment, but you know, it's a challenge to try and build this balance between uh, uh, buying shares at a bargain um, and also looking for shares that are growing. So obviously shares that are growing will have a higher price. So just be aware of that. So you might, uh, be, you know, if you're not mastering it properly, you might build up a, a portfolio of shares that are going to give you a mediocre performance. I personally like to have a mixture between value and growth shares in my portfolio. So different combinations to add it together. So on our website again, you can click on the little button here called uh, research, search and then growth at a reasonable price. It'll spit out a list of shares for you. So remember the focus here is on growth. I'm looking for shares growing by more than 15%. From a valuation point of view, you can see a lot of these shares are yellow. So remember these are fairly value stocks. These are shares that are rising, are rising quite fast. What I like to do is find shares that are growing fast and still undervalued. Those are the shares of green. And I bring in all the other criteria. So that's how I bring that combination. Okay. So the share comes out of, comes out of this one I've been focusing on. Um, it's a company called Eltron. Uh, we've heard about Altec. Um, this is Eltron, obviously the parent of the company. Uh, yes, you can see over here, this is based on to February. The, the, the earnings were down. The turnover was down. But we forecast in going forward that these guys are a bit of a turnaround. Um, they're, they're all looking at, obviously, uh, taking out uh, alt tech uh, and things like that, but we're forecasting more than 50% growth going forward. Hence, uh, while the shares uh, comes up on this list. So it looks like technically, also trading in the ta down channel, uh, it's gone below that 66, so it's oversold, you know, everything's, as I say, everybody's ignoring the stock, maybe it's the stock you want to start focusing on. So that gives you the idea of what you want to look at. Lastly, let's look at investing for dividends quickly. This is the most straightforward and easiest way of looking at the market. Uh, your approach is you're looking for, for income. You're looking for a steady, steady flow of, of income, be it every month or quarter or every year. You get a bit of a combination of only shares, some bonds in your portfolio, maybe some uh, preference shares. Uh, you, your goal is to look for regular uh, payments, regular income. Okay. So you obviously you focus more on the mature companies, companies being around for a longer two period of time. Uh, they have predictable earning streams. They might not be growing by like 50% every year. But every year they might be growing about by 20%, giving you that 3 or 4% dividend yield. Okay. The challenge of this, you know, just go about dividends alone. What about future growth? Um, so uh, you have to be aware of that. Uh, can dividends pay out all the, the dividends? Can dividends can only be paid out of profits anyway, not out of assets. Okay. So there are risks involved in the sense that uh, what happens if there is a, a financial hardship? We've seen it before with Anglos. They don't pay out a dividend. Prefer to rather keep all the cash, reinvest it back into the business. Or another opportunity comes along, they don't want to uh, uh, lay out uh, uh, too much cash uh, from uh, borrowings and things like that, it's rather use dividends. So this is a bit of a balance. Obviously, you ought to be, rec uh, be uh, uh, rewarded if the company does that. But uh, bottom line, you still have to do your homework, look at the fundamentals, not just under the dividend yield. Okay. 
you want to build up a, a well-balanced portfolio. So I just add as another, as another criteria uh, when I select my shares in my portfolio. Okay. Uh, and there's various things we look at. There's two things I always look at. Uh, again, if I can click on investing for dividends, it spits out a list of shares for me. That's on the, under the value uh, tab. It's going by the dividend yield. Okay. Now, for example, Bola Metcalf is one share that I like. I've been punting about it in our newsletters and things like that. It's got a dividend yield of 4.6. Maybe anything about two and a half to three percent is the average of the market. These guys are giving you 4.6. But you can also click on the, the quality tab and that'll give you the payout ratio. Now, Bola Metcalf, for example, pays out more than half of his, uh, of his uh, earnings, its, its, its profits, in the form of dividends. Okay, obviously the younger the company, the might reinvest most of its dividends back. I remember for a long time that MTN was a growth company and uh, they were only paid a, a, a small percentage of their, of their profits in the form of dividends. They have become a bit more mature, they pay out much more. But this is another way you can start choosing shares to add into your portfolio. Look for shares that are pay out regular dividends and there's growth in those dividends. So Bella Metcalf. This is on 14th of March. It's a packaging company, mainly in the, in the classic side. Um, you say look at the dividend yield, 4.6%. Um, I like it so. Uh, it's not too expensive. Um, I believe there's opportunities. So uh, I've been putting this in our, in our bi-monthly um, newsletter called the, the Investor. Uh, I think I wrote it about, it about oof, quite a few months ago. Um, so yeah, it's plodding along there. Uh, again, the weekly chart, you can see it's forming a bit of a triangle, anticipated breakout of this soon. Both those moving averages, at least slightly overbought. It uh, might pull back slightly, might come back, retest this uh, uh, long term support trend line, as well as the 200 week moving average. Um, yeah, volume distribution, so a bit more of a sell off, uh, and start to underperforming the market. But you know, the, the price hasn't dropped radically, anticipated a bounce from that. So uh, just a quick summary before we get into the questions. Uh, value investing uh, is a defensive investment approach, especially in the bear market, especially in, in, a, in an environment where there's a lot of uncertainty right now. We're not in the bear market, we're a bit more, we're obviously in a, in a bull market, but uh, these are the shares that you're going to buy and nibble at with okay, four or five years time, or three years time, at least giving you 50% returns. And there are quite a few that, uh, that you can look at. Growth or GARP, uh, if the shares are all the high growth shares, uh, a bit more of the momentum investment approach. That's what, what, what the trend has been on the market for the last two years. Especially the RAM hedge stocks. Those are the ones you've been focusing on. And investing for dividends, obviously a bit more of a mature, well-established companies that could be paying out the substantial and regular dividends. Okay. A quick summary. Uh, you need to develop your own style of investing. Okay. I'll be trying to talk, uh, uh, highlight it for you. You want to uh, match your investment strategy to your personality. And the, my approach to the market is, yes, I combine fundamentals and technicals together as what I call rational analysis. Okay? And the fundamentals, I look at value, growth, and dividends. A bit of a fruit salad approach to the market. And I also bring in the technicals. So I try and find shares that are in a bullish trend. They are a bit of a, uh, a bottom of the cycle uh, and outperforming the market. Those are the shares that you're looking at that will be in your portfolio eventually. Obviously, right now, it's the opposite. They might be in a bearish trend. Uh, yes, some of them might be oversold right now and some of them might be underperforming. So a bit of a, a, bit of a, a contrast there, doing the opposite. But those are the things ultimately you'll be focusing on. Okay. So a quick summary before I get into the questions. Those of you who haven't got a trading account with us yet, um, you know, can visit us. I always joke and I say, you know what does PhD stand for? So it's profits are great and people are good. So come test us out. Uh, those of you that, that don't know what I'm talking about regarding all these uh, fundamentals, we have online tutorials, goes into more detail, uh, macro and micro, as well as all the technicals I've been talking about. There's the equity simulator where you can test these ideas in a risk-free environment, and I've been highlighting the research tools available for you. There's a the fundamental tools available on our website. The technical charting I've been using is a, is a program called WEN, software is for free, we have to do subscribe to the download. So these are tools, even as an investor, you can use to help you make better informed decisions. And that was the, the process I'm trying to, my main objective for you today is to start developing a process for yourself. Now we talk about uh, as a trader, you'll have a trading plan and a game plan for the day. The same thing as an investor. Have a plan, have a strategy. Okay. So as I say, the presentation will be emailed to you guys uh, 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 soon uh, together with the uh, 
hopefully with the recording, it came out right. So from my side, good luck and uh, happy trading. There's my contact details, um, and let's see what kind of questions we have here before we uh, we close off. Okay. Um, so bear with me quickly. Uh, is there a way to download the audio later instead of just listening if you're streaming? Marius, yes, I, as I said, I'll be sending the, the message through to you guys just now. Uh, where can I get all of the recordings? Uh, uh, Mr. Clark, uh, if you on this on this webinar, I've got your email. I'll be sending you an email. Okay. Uh, okay. There's just a lot of questions, guys. Answering me yesterday, then you could hear me. I was panicking earlier on about the audio. Um, where can I get a hold of the recordings? Uh, what is the website, uh, John? Look, um, what website are you referring to? Uh, this is John Luke uh, Quirch. I'm not 100% sure there. Uh, John Clark here. Is the market too expensive to buy now? Or should I wait? Uh, this is for uh, Jan Yuri uh, 3. Um, as I said, I did a scan a day or so ago on the value side. The list was very small. Uh, there's not many shares that are cheap right now. majority of the shares are what I call fairly valued. So, um, yeah, there's obviously a lot of volatility, especially the rand right now. Uh, we're talking about it this morning where uh, John Marcus, the Reserve Bank Governor, says it's not so much the, the, the level of the rand, it's more the volatility that's, that's creating uh, headaches for everybody. One, one minute, I saw this morning we're at 10.25. Uh, within like an hour period, we're trading at, at, at 9 rand 95. Now, 30 cents doesn't sound a lot. But when it comes to, to currency trading and things like that, or just movement, uh, that's hectic. You know, uh, that's serious volatility. Okay. So to answer your question, there are opportunities, uh, but you have to do your homework. Okay. Uh, what are your top three, uh, top three, top fifty shares at the moment? Um, yo, I'm not so much into the, into the top one, uh, top fifties right now. Um, I'm even looking at more of the small caps. This is a question for from uh, Christopher Mills. Um, Christopher, I've been looking at things like uh, KG Media. Uh, they've been obviously, there's been a lot of speculation about KG Media for a while. Uh, I like uh, that's a media company that's more involved in radio advertising and, and quite a few radio stations. And I just got involved in Juta, which is the textbook side. Um, some some um, market rumors are going around there. So the share price jumped up a lot. Of, uh, uh, I think it was Monday. Um, I like KG Media. I like Bokov. Um, if I had a look at the top 50, or the top 100 companies, there will be a lot of the industrial RAND head stocks, but they are trading in overbought territory and they are uh, had a good run, so they might be pulling back. Um, on my CFD trading, and I'm digressing a bit, uh, we put out a daily stock broker. Yesterday I put out a, a recommendation on Woolies. Uh, a lot of the retailers have fallen a lot. Uh, they are trading near the uh, 61% uh, Fibonacci retracement levels, anticipated bounce from here soon. Uh, this morning we put a one on, on out in Barlow's. We missed it by four cents. Um, I still like the, the property shares, the growth points, and the, and the redefines. I think there might be a rebound there. Um, but obviously, these are more from a trading point of view. Uh, investment. Um, I've always liked Invicta. I know Invicta's just come out of the trading statement. We anticipate the earnings to be more than 25% higher. Uh, I've had Invicta in my portfolio for many, many years. Great company, but not cheap right now. So, Christopher, I hope that gave you some ideas. Okay. Um, great, guys. Um, I hope it uh, benefited you. There doesn't seem to be any more questions. But if any questions, you can always just email me. As I say, uh, there's my email address, seanvdb at psg.coza. Um, don't just find me and say, Sean, what do you think of uh, bulletins? I want to know what you've done on the homework and things like that too. Okay. So, guys, thanks for your uh, for the opportunity. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed the webinar. I hope it was beneficial. And as I said, I will be sending the presentation to you soon. Please review it. Uh, and then obviously use the tools, uh, uh, put it to practice what you're learning here. From my side, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye for now.